Remember lights, camera, pants? The console version, remember, we have to make that distinction here. Many often consider it to be the Spongebob equivalent of Mario Party, but would you believe there's another game that can make a case for that title? The Sarbakan Truther Square game was made as part of the Nick Arcade and followed the release of their online board games. These were the Game of Life and Monopoly, which we already covered. This was another digital board game, but with a more original concept. Maybe if Lights, Camera, Pants is the Spongebob Mario Party, this could be considered the Sonic Shuffle. To give some background, Truth or Square was a special Spongebob episode that aired in 2009 to commemorate the show's 10-year anniversary. It featured both a cartoon and a live-action segment where Patchy the Pirate would interact with random celebrities. You might be surprised to hear that, for once in a blue moon, I actually saw the episode when it first aired. Very rare for me, I know. But not to be overly critical, but I remember being a little disappointed. All the commercials showed the characters going on these wild quests and having all sorts of adventures, but then in the actual episode, they were just stuck in the air vents the entire time. Also, when I first heard it was going to be an episode where the characters reflected on their favorite moments from the past, I assumed it would be like a clip show with an overarching story, but all the past moments were made up for the special. Still, we aren't here to review the episode. I'm not nitpicky enough to be a cartoon reviewer. Now, going into this game, I had some high expectations. I liked what Sarbakan did with the Game of Life and Monopoly games, even if they had their flaws. I knew we were in for something a little more well-made than most Nick Arcade games. With Atlantis Square Pantis Square Off coming out two years before, it seemed like the Nick Arcade was in the middle of a renaissance. These games were actually decent. So let's see if Truth or Square can keep up the momentum. At the very start, a 16-bit SpongeBob voice introduces you to the game. SpongeBob SquarePants here. Welcome to Truth or Square. This is the best game in the history of best games. All you have to do is get to the Krusty Krab's anniversary party by flipping tiles to make your way through a maze of air ducts, playing lots of wacky mini games as you collect the most happy moments to win the game. Not to mention, party down at the Krusty Krab. He sounds a little unsettling. I wouldn't want to hear this voice alone in a dark hallway at night. Also, check it out. This game is from ages 7 to 77. If you're 78, I don't know what to tell you. Just too old. So the story is a little similar to the episode. You're in the vents, and you need to get back to the Krusty Krab to celebrate the 117th anniversary of the restaurant. I see they use the Hobbit counting system. You make a profile and choose from the same four characters that were in the board games, Spongebob, Sandy, Patrick, and Squidward. You then get a cool 3D transition into the board. It's a little sad the rest of the game doesn't look like this, but it's still unique in its own way. You have to uncover tiles throughout the vents to find games and other mechanisms to help you recover your special memories. Keeping with the theme of the episode, you have to remember all your favorite memories before you can unlock the exit and win the game. You can choose to either have 3, 5, or 10 memories to unlock, and this determines how long the game is. Unlike in the special, the memories include scenes from the actual episodes, such as working the first 24-hour shift, the first Krusty Krab talent show, meeting Santa, meeting Sandy, getting into the Salty Spittoon, meeting Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy, and so on. Squidward's first Krabby Patty is here, but I can't imagine he remembers that too fondly considering what became of his thighs shortly afterwards. You unlock these memories by competing in games to unlock cards. Every round, you spin the spinner with your mouse, then you receive a certain number of covered tiles you can uncover and a certain number of steps you can move. You can go in any viable direction to move throughout the board. You also want to keep an eye on your happiness, which is represented by a three-part energy bar. You can raise your happiness by flipping tiles or sliding on grease, which can take you over multiple tiles at once. You can also get happiness by playing games represented by these gifts. Now for an interesting little note about the spinner, you can spin it so hard that it shakes the entire screen, but I consistently rolled ones and twos whenever I'd do this. But when I'd give it just a pathetic little push, I'd get threes and fours. It didn't happen all the time, but often enough for me to notice. You can also use your happiness to buy advantages, depending on how full your meter is. They say money can't buy happiness, but in this game, happiness is money. So make of that what you will. You can remove any one obstacle, you can put a jester hat on someone to drain their happiness, you can put a speaker that plays sad music and drain the happiness of anyone who walks by it, you can summon a jellyfish to wander the board and sting anyone it comes across, and you can also summon Gary to leave a trail of grease everywhere he goes. 
It's fun to watch him cover entire sections of the board, but he eventually reaches a point where he goes back and forth for no real reason, which kind of kills the fun of it. There's also this drain that teleports someone somewhere else on the board. These require you to strategize throughout the game, but it does kind of interrupt the flow whenever the game stops you and forces you to buy an advantage. Of course, you can choose not to, but why would you? You have the chance to tilt the game in your favor, why not? That's right, you have to think in this game. I know, don't we all just hate that? Like with Life and Monopoly, this is a heavily competitive game where you have to tear down the other players. You can even relocate the exit right before a competitor reaches it. Yeah, you'll be known as the jerk that wouldn't let the game end. At least you don't have to forcibly plunge your friends into debt this time. Another cool feature is that you can willingly exchange your flips into moves and your moves into happiness. This can benefit you when you run out of spaces where you can walk to. It can also help you move farther if you don't roll enough to get where you want to go. Good feature, Sarbakken. One feature I don't really like, however, is this star you can land on when moving the spinner. It forces everyone into a minigame where you can get bonus points by button mashing to collect falling patties. It goes on for way too long. It feels like it'll never end. <laughs> Come on, is it still going? My keyboard's about to break. End it already. Now let's check out some of these mini-games. There are ones you can unlock by reaching a gift, which will give you happiness, and others that exist for the sake of finding your memories. The first gift game I encountered was this one where you have to spin by smashing the heck out of your keyboard. Again, as we learn from Monopoly and Life, Sarbakken games are loaded with button mashing. It's not that I entirely hate it, I'm even good at a lot of these games, but they could afford to be a little more creative. I keep thinking I'm gonna break my keyboard with how frequently I have to bombard it. So the spinning game is interesting because you have to hit the forward key to keep yourself spinning, but you have to switch to the left and right keys to readjust yourself when you start leaning one way or the other. I got the hang of it eventually, but it's really difficult to understand at first. I wasn't sure if I needed to keep hitting the forward key as well as the left and right key, so it kept messing me up. Another gift game involves this weird-looking jellyfish as it moves between players who have to hit a certain key combination to avoid being squirted with jelly and eliminated. Could they have not just used a regular jellyfish design for this? What the heck is this thing? There's a similar one that has a pufferfish instead of a jellyfish. Careful, that's Mrs. Puff's cousin. It's also kind of funny and heartbreaking at the same time to see all the characters get unreasonably sad when you win. Your victory is tormentious for your opponents. Speaking of the other characters, I have a little side note. In the actual Truth or Square, Mr. Krabs is the other character in the vents, and Sandy is hardly in the episode apart from one scene. In this, Mr. Krabs is completely out of the picture, and Sandy is in the vents instead. This might be because Sarbakken had the Sandy graphic on hand from the Monopoly game and decided to throw her into this one as well to save on time, but that's just a theory. There's another masher where you have to play instruments better than everyone else. This is the one time you'll see Squidward excel at something music related. And another masher where you have to break yourself out of ice. You mash one key till you find a crack, then you alternate between two different keys to break a body part out of the ice. At least it isn't just one button the entire time. You get to break multiple buttons on your keyboard. There's a similar one where you smash a button to blow bubbles, but you have to get it to be just the right size before releasing it with another button. If it gets too big or too small, it pops. Thankfully, I played SpongeBob Bubble Rush, so I'm an official bubble-blowing expert. I didn't get kicked out of Thug Tug for nothing. I struggled with this other gift game because I misread the instructions and thought I was supposed to hold the button rather than mash it. I know, I really should have known better. Other than that, it's really easy if you know what to do. You're kicking Plankton's relatives to see who can fly the farthest, which is admittedly a hilarious concept. But again, my inability to understand instructions left me confused and losing by a considerable margin. I guess when you're playing against the computer, there isn't anyone you can use as a frame of reference when you don't understand something. 
I really need to find people to play with. I can't say many of my friends were too eager to huddle around a computer with me for hours on end to play one of these games. You think it's awkward asking them to play a virtual game of Spongebob Monopoly? Try explaining this game to them. Yeah, it's a, a Spongebob game where you flip tiles and every so often another game comes up and you have to, can we just play an actual board game? If you want to rig it and give yourself an easy win, just set all the characters to human players and control them all yourself. The game just takes your word for it when you tell it you're different people. You can set your computer opponents to be easy, medium, or hard, but they're decently challenging no matter what you set their intelligence to. So now let's check out some of the memory games. These basically determine the outcome of the whole thing, so they're kind of important. If you activate a memory card, every other player teams up against you to stop you from getting the memory. If you lose, the memory card flies somewhere on the board and you have to try and reach it. The most common minigame I encountered for it is this tug-of-war game with a Krabby Patty ice sculpture. This was actually in the episode, so it's a nice tie-in. It's always good when you can tell the developers actually watched the thing they were making an adaptation of. This minigame, however, sucks. You and the other players have to hit button combinations as they appear to tug on your side of the sculpture, but if you're playing with the computer, you have to rely on the NPCs who constantly fumble their combinations. Meanwhile, the memory getter keeps getting constant combinations so they're able to tug on their own side without much trouble. So even if you're lightning fast when it's your turn to hit the buttons, you'll still lose because the NPCs suck at it. I have never played this minigame and seen anyone besides the memory getter win. Even when it was me. Yeah, I can confirm it was a lot easier then. Another one is this karate championship where the other three players have to hold a button and launch themselves at the memory finder who then tries to dodge them. I really like this one in concept, but man is it strict. I only got hit one single time and it was enough for me to lose. Why not just end the challenge as soon as I get hit if that's all it takes? Also, if you're on the opposing end, you can just batter your enemy relentlessly. Kinda pointless, but it's fun. Good thing I'm not playing with actual people, because even if I had friends to play this with, I wouldn't have them anymore by the time we finished it. In another one, you're in a claw machine, and if you're the memory getter, you have to try and catch the other players, who can determine when they jump out of the many different holes. They can't determine which hole they come out of, though. I think the developers might have confused a whack-a-mole machine with a claw machine, but it's an okay concept. It's all about overwhelming the memory finder with distractions. Be careful, though. If Squidward wins this challenge, he just might torment a small child because of it. When a player collects all their memories, the exit appears, then it becomes a race to reach it. Whoever makes it there first with all their memories wins the game. It can actually be a super stressful sprint to the finish. Every other player will do everything in their power to keep you from making it, placing obstacles that stop you or make you slide in your path. Again, they might even move the exit entirely, so make sure they don't have enough happiness to afford that. Better throw those jester hats on them. But if it's too hard in the regular game mode, you can actually play team mode. In this, you have a partner that you can share your points with and compete in mini-games with. Only one drawback. Your partner sucks. They're useful in the karate game because they can block others that attack you, but in the crane game, they're either the one controlling the game or the one grabbing. But they're way too slow either way. Ideas like this were definitely made to be used by more than one player. Still, it's a lot easier when you have someone else watching your back. So all in all, the game is decent. It's a lot of critical thinking to evaluate what ways you want to go, how you want to block people, how to balance your happiness, and so on. Did I mention Spongebob talks to you in his 16-bit voice the entire game? Okay, kid. I want you to get in there and get that better! How about a little more muscle this time? No! All that hard work for nothing! I actually like it. It adds life to the game and keeps it from feeling dead. They went the extra mile to add a feature that gave it more spirit. Even if I didn't enjoy all the minigames, I still appreciate this little tournament. It's nice that they tried to do something original after adapting two big board games, and the idea is fairly engaging with plenty of strategizing along the way. I wouldn't say it's better or worse than Monopoly or the Game of Life, I'd just say it's on par with them. It's a respectable addition to the Nick Arcade. Thank you for joining me, I will see you in the next memory.